The Royal Forest of Dean is on the border of England and Wales. It's one of Europe's most ancient forests. Oak from here built the ships of the Royal Navy, and its most famous son, Admiral Lord Nelson, is responsible for the survival of the oak stands. Written records going back more than a thousand years indicate that this has always been a working forest, providing farmers, miners, charcoal makers and iron smelters with a living. Despite these activities, the forest has always provided a refuge for wildlife. Today, tourists in ever greater numbers threaten the age-old balance between forest and the people of the Dean. Another threat comes from the grey squirrel, a relatively recent arrival from North America. And there's continual pressure from the grazing sheep. The outbreak of foot and mouth in Britain has given the forest respite from sheep and tourists. Filmed over the seasons, this week's Earth Report assesses whether this small pocket of wilderness will survive another millennium intact. The Royal Forest of Dean is in England's West Midlands between the rivers Severn and Wye. Silver and brass bands, a relic of the days when thousands of men worked the coal seams, are still the music of the forest. Foresters born here have ancient rights. First, the right to keep sheep in the unfenced forest. The second, to mine coal or minerals working as free miners. Gerald works this mine alone, whose right to mine goes back to antiquity, but was enshrined in law in the 13th century by the English king Edward I, when foresters served him well during his wars with the Scots. Gerald's mine is deep in the forest, near two ponds that are a haven for wildlife. A man has to be born here in the forest and has to have worked in a mine for a year and a day before he can become a free miner. Fifty years ago, there were 5,000 coal miners working in the forest. Today, Gerald is one of the last free miners still earning his living this way. His one-man mine has become a tourist attraction. Visitors are allowed access to all parts of the forest. In the most visited parts, the wildlife is rare and wild plants increasingly threatened. From a small town in the heart of the Dean, a UK government agency, Forest Enterprise, administers the Royal Forest. It continues a thousand-year-old tradition of central government protection. From the time of the Norman conquest in the 11th century, the forest was reserved as a hunting ground for kings. And the revenues from iron mined and smelted here went into their coffers. As England developed into a naval power, the oak assumed strategic value. In 1633, Charles I created the post of deputy surveyor to take overall charge of the forest. Since then, there's been an unbroken line of 25 royal deputy surveyors. Today we manage the forest for a whole range of purposes um, and consequently the, the management is very much more complex perhaps than it used to be. So that uh, we still do produce timber and it's still a very important aspect of our work. Um, 
the the uh, revenue it generates helps to pay for the for the other aspects. Equally so, we are involved very very actively in managing the forest for conservation purposes. That requires quite a lot of um, balancing up of the of the objectives for where we will manage for timber or how we will manage the woodlands and so on in order to uh, optimize the biodiversity values of the forest. We're also a very, very big visitor attraction here. In autumn, people come to collect mushrooms. The forest is home to a huge variety of fungi, some edible, most not. The group are given a quick lesson by a local expert on what is safe to eat. To properly identify a fungus, you've got to get the base of the stem. You've got to dig down into the soil with your knife. I hope you've all got knives with you. Uh, it's very important to have. You see, in this case, it's got a bulbous uh, uh, bottom to the stem here. This, by the way, is a very, very good one to eat and is virtually uh, unmistakable for anything else. And it's got a ring here, which is very distinguished in its appearance, and is very, very good to eat. Well, now, this is a kind of bullied country, isn't it? We better look around and see if we can see any others. <laughs> Most visitors just come for the walks and the spectacular scenery. This is probably the most well-visited spot in the, in the central portion of the Dean, Beechenhurst Lodge, which is the, the premier visitor site in the, in the forest for Forest Enterprise, is about a quarter of a mile below us there. And during the summer, we have droves of people coming up along this way, uh, visiting the sculptures. This is one of the sculptures called Place that is directly behind us, and it's maintained as an open viewpoint. So we've probably got a third of a million to a million people, somewhere of that order, coming up and seeing this view every year. So it's particularly sensitive. Anything that we do is, is in terms of felling, has has to be a, a scale that befits the landscape and the landscape form. And because it's a big landscape, it's likely to be large scale working. This is one way in which the, the forest can be regenerated on a small scale. Behind me you can see the, the fallen crowns of two or three trees there and these are mature oak trees that have been felled and are being cleared at the moment to create a, a hole in the, in the forest canopy and that will encourage enough light through to get natural regeneration of a variety of species but mostly oak and uh, beech to, to regenerate. Over to my right now we'll see an area that's been opened up in the past possibly 10-15 years ago the regeneration has, has now become established and that'll be, be growing quite well now and they will form the the next crop of oak trees in this particular area so this demonstrates really that that, that could eventually end up as two or three uh, mature oak trees from that 100, 150 small oak saplings that you have now given a correct thinning regime. This is Britain's premier oak forest. The forest was planted for a purpose. It was uh, regarded as the prime location for sourcing timber for building ships. In demand not only for ships but also for construction and smelting, the oak in the Dean was en route for extinction. It didn't help that very few acorns and seedlings escaped the attentions of the pigs and sheep. Admiral Lord Nelson, in 1803, visited the Forest of Dean in order to ascertain what resources were available in order to fuel the, the naval building programme uh, of, of warships. And when he came here, he, he was absolutely appalled at what was going on. It was estimated about that time, and he, he actually makes specific reference to that, that there were about only 200 acres of good quality ship's timber left standing in the Dean, and the, the Dean itself is around 20,000 acres. There's, there's various estimates how many oaks were used to build a warship, but one commonly banded around is that there are about a thousand mature oak trees 
And he went away and subsequently wrote a report that was presented to the government, essentially urging something be done. And following that, we saw for something like 40 years, until the mid-1800s, a massive initiative to replant the woodlands of the Dean. In the 20th century, there were, there were dramatic impacts. And this was probably most dramatic in the Second World War, when there was what, what is locally still known as the Great Felling, when nearly half of the whole forest was cleared. A um, huge area was cleared of trees, and most of that was replanted with conifers. This oak tree was planted around 1812 and it's this size after nearly 200 years of growth which was one of the reasons why conifers were planted here in the first place because they will reach this size of timber in probably about 60 70 years as usual we've got a spread of lots in winter hardwoods such as oak and sycamore are sold by auction profits go to forest enterprise to help it in the time honored fashion of a wilderness paying its way across to Norfolk Kent. Uh, we're on then to uh, lot number eight, this uh, sycamore at um, Groom Hill in Blakeney Walk. Uh, 4,000. Four, four, is that a bid up the doorway? Four I'm offered at 4,000 pounds. 15,800 pounds. Is that 16? 16. At 16,000. At 16. 16, two. Oh, well, you've done then. Going. At 16,200 left. Chancellor? 16,002. That lot is sold, sir. They've got a bit of rot in. A team arrived to fell the trees, and the buyer shows us why he was prepared to pay so much. That's what we call a ripple sycamore. Now that is the most valuable sycamore of all, is the ripple. Now that will go for very expensive furniture, and the rougher of the ripple uh, sycamore will go for musical instruments where you make your fiddles and your violins and whatnot. when you see the face of the violin yeah. see all the ripple up and down it that's where it comes from uh -huh. and that is the most expensive sycamore tree you will get is the rippled one how did you get the ripple? <laughs> <laughs> good question if I knew that <laughs> you know, we could yeah. probably make a lot of money with the timber merchants I mean I think um, it's, it's either a genetic factor at play or it's possibly something to do with either the site conditions or the way the tree has grown. Some of the trees are quite valuable so uh, when you fell them you don't want them landing and breaking. Um, what we're talking about that is the tops where it forks. You've got to get right up the top of the tree and cut the one fork off or cut the two forks off and that saves the stem because if they land on the forks they will break so it's not just a question of walking into the wood and cutting the trees off it's a bit more specialist than that really yeah. just line it up yeah. at least he went in the right place <laughs> It's nice when it goes right. When it goes wrong, it's not so nice. <laughs> right. I get a sweat on. Gets the adrenaline pump in. Only 250 hardwood trees will be felled this year. The wood is sold with the guarantee that it comes from a sustainably managed forest. Another hardwood tree is planted, but there's a problem. If we were to try and replant sycamore in an area like this where we have so many squirrels, we'd never get the sycamore up to this sort of size and quality because of the impact of squirrels. Um, sycamore is particularly susceptible to squirrel damage, they seem to like it for some reason. Um, if you look at the beach, for example, that tree there, you can see all that damage at about 10-15 feet. That's all being caused by squirrels stripping the bark off. 
um, and at those points on that beech tree uh, the wood will have been stained, there will have been fungus got in there and it's quite likely or quite possible that at some point in its future life the top will blow out of that beech tree and uh, from the point of view of producing good quality timber that beech tree is never going to produce good quality timber. This is the wettest year ever known in the forest with the water draining out of the plateau causing widespread flooding. There are many things that threaten trees in their lifetime. Grazing sheep pose one threat and the exploding fallow deer population another. Particularly vulnerable are young saplings. Typical sort of brazing damage yeah. that you get with deer. And if they constantly keep browsing away on young trees like this, I mean, it holds the trees in check, effectively, because the tree never grows up. And the whole aim of natural regeneration is to get these young, naturally produced seedlings eventually taking over from the mature trees round about. And if the deer are constantly browsing these young trees, those young trees never become established. I mean, this is, this is about 15 years of age. It was originally planted as a, a research plot to do some uh, research studies on and in order to get the oak established and get it to grow the area was deer fenced as you can see um, and it's interesting if you contrast the the trees and the vegetation that you've got inside the area which is fenced to exclude deer and contrast that with the area which is open to deer and the odd sheep that gets in and the difference in the vegetation levels that you've got you know it's quite clear to see you know what the level what the impact of grazing has on the level of vegetation that you get within an area um, and if the if the forest was was completely open and, and sheep had particularly sheep had sort of open access across the forest uh, it would the whole forest would tend to look far more like the area behind us here um, where the vegetation has been removed completely and some would argue that's, that's you know, what we want because it's nice and easy to walk through but from a sort of ecological point of view and a botanical interest point of view um, that is probably somewhat less interesting than areas like this which aren't exposed to the same degree of grazing. Much more dangerous is the recently arrived North American grey squirrel which very quickly drove out the native red squirrel. In a forest where you know, half the area is given over to growing broadleaf trees if you're getting this sort of damage on young trees, it normally occurs on trees roughly between age 20 and age 50 or so. Um, and if you're getting this sort of damage which is killing trees and you've got a high proportion of broadleaf trees in your forest, this is a major problem. Um, and what we're finding now over the last sort of five to ten years is that we're finding we're not only getting this sort of damage on broadleaf trees, but we're also getting it on conifer trees. Um, and that's particularly worrying because conifers are what uh, generate the larger part of our income in the forest in terms of timber. If you look around in, in crops such as some of the larch behind you, you can see where the tops have actually broken out as a result of squirrels damaging the tree, the tops being killed off and then breaking out. That allows fungal pathogens to get into the tree and may affect the quality of the wood through timber degrade. It's, it's difficult enough trying to, to get broadleaf trees regenerated uh, successfully. You get them up to age 15, 20 years of age and then they're attacked by squirrels um, and the impacts of squirrels can be as great as the impact, if not greater, than deer. So a real problem and we haven't really got a solution as to how to control the damage. Their numbers are artificially high because they beat birds to the seed left out for them by bird lovers. In January, a rare fall of snow is an unusual event in today's forest. A beacon in the middle of the forest commands a view over seven counties. Local residents are upset because their view is about to be spoiled by these seedlings carefully staked and protected. 
We have a newcomer living in the farm just down below where I'm stood now and he has, through a grant from the government, planted in lots and lots of trees, seven rows deep in places but mostly five rows, which is in a few years time going to spoil the view from the top of this hill. And we are stood on the top of Roardine Hill which is the highest point of the Forest of Dean. So local residents meet in their village hall to see what they can do to get the trees removed. First and foremost, you are very, very welcome and thank you very much for, for attending. At each stage of, of our negotiations, everybody has been most uh, sort of um, polite and courteous to Mr and Mrs Moneycrow and I, I, I'm confident that that's the way we will, will continue. You're in a very awkward situation. Somebody who owns land has every right to plant on their land whatever. And in fact, what they could have done is planted Leyland cypress over the whole thing. And there is absolutely nothing anybody could do about it because planting trees is not subject to any form of, of permission. Now, he did raise yeah, it yeah. with them, yes. and uh, they said, well, we got the grant, uh, yes. we can do... Too late, know. too late. So we are completely at their whim. It is unique, it's, it's historic, and the local population has invested so much time in that area. They have prepared the beacon. It's regarded as a significant. It can be seen from a greater distance than any other in the country. Now, I'm sure if we raise the stakes, Irrespective of what the local forestry commission or anybody else say, I think at the end of the day, public opinion will win the day. In the spring, footpaths are closed. In this way, the authorities hope to stop foot and mouth disease spreading into the forest. An outbreak has been found only a few kilometers away. Television pictures of the slaughter will be beamed around the world. There are 2,000 sheep in the forest, and if even one is infected, all will be slaughtered to contain its spread. For one forester's flock, things look bad. This is the beginning of the end, I reckon. You know. <coughs> all the forest, you can see down there, the line now of them burning the cattle down in there. Where, there, where I got the foot and mouth down there, look, it's about a mile and a half, two mile away, look. And they're down there burning the cattle. That you can see the clouds of smoke flying across the skyline there. Look. You think this is going to be your turn next? Uh. That's what you'd think. Because it's only, a, might as well say, a stone throw away. Spring is lambing time. Topsy and Henry, who've kept sheep all their lives, can only wonder if their sheep will be alive in a month's time. <laughs> Some foresters believe that their ancient traditions are under threat from new people moving in, and they're looking for a way to preserve these traditions. And that's what we really need to achieve, is, is a way forward to safeguard and secure our, our heritage and our history and our background and our rights. I mean, we've got to have the forest people involved, every little development, Absolutely. people Absolutely. been fighting about it, instead of in one lump. And we've got an influx of uh, the people. Like saying, get on back where it's come from and leave us alone. Appreciate they can't that. adapt to our way of living, and well, they I shouldn't mean, be here. Yeah. Um, I'm one of the people that the gentleman sitting over there would like to send back home again. But um, I'm sorry, my daughter's married a forester. I've got a grandchild, and uh, I'm a forester at heart now. What's, what I would like to say is that I think this idea of the foresters banding together and speaking with one voice is absolutely brilliant. In my book, anybody, whether he's been here 50 years or 10 years, if he's got his heart in the right place, he'll do for me as a forester. That's right, that's true. And yeah, I think yeah. that's yeah, yeah. very, very important. But we can do without the people who come into the forest who want to obliterate views upon Rurdy Nell. Yeah. You asked us not to mention it, Mr Chairman, but it's crucial. We can do without the people who don't consider our heritage, our culture, is most <coughs> important.
But there's a much more immediate problem for the people. Foot and mouth did arrive. All the forest sheep have been rounded up and the slaughter has begun. On, Just cured the forest. Did you have foot and mouth in yours? Well, they said I had it. They called it exclusive, which they wasn't sure whether it was foot and mouth or whether it wasn't. I could never find out what it was. Now, that's the butchers there. And that's uh, another photograph of them up the road, all penned in, ready to be killed. To make your tears come in your eyes, mate, when you see your, all your sheep are going. But we're just getting over it now. But it just still hurt. Well, the forest is dead. There's nothing in the forest. It's in, you go up through there now, you can go up there now, and all up the road there, there's all reeves, crosses, photographs of sheep, you know, like put on cardboard, and all, all up there. The irony is that with the paths closed and the removal of all the sheep, the royal forest is having a brief respite. The absence of tourists and grazing sheep allow for a lush spring growth this year. The forest and its occupants have weathered many crises, and only time will tell whether the ever-increasing number of tourists and alien invaders, like the grey squirrel, will change this pocket wilderness for good.